Are you a business owner or entrepreneur who's had great success in the business world? And now you want to launch a speaking career to share your message with the world. If that's you, then listen up. 25 year speaking industry veteran Brett Ridgway has released his latest special report. Three key things entrepreneurs must master to build a profitable speaking business. To pick up your copy, go to breadridgeway.com forward slash freebie. Welcome to the Spotlight on Speaking Show with Brett Ridgway, where you'll learn the keys to building a profitable speaking business from speaking industry pros. Each week, we interview a great guest who will share his or her speaking journey, identify what their keys to success have been, and highlight some critical mistakes they've made along the way that you'll want to avoid. Be sure to visit our website at SpotlightOnSpeaking.com. And while you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, sit back, tune in, and get ready to meet this week's guest. Hello again, everyone. This is Brett Ridgway, and welcome to another episode of the Spotlight on Speaking show. And I'm super excited for my guests this week because I've known this lady for maybe close to 20 years. We crossed paths many times at industry events. Mm -hmm. I've been blessed to have spoken at some of her all through you events. And she's just a, a wealth of knowledge on book publishing, speaking, the whole gamut or whatever. But Dr. Judith Bryles is an award-winning and best-selling author of 43 books now. This includes author you creating and building your author and book platforms, how to create snappy, sassy, salty success for authors and publishers, how to create crowdfunding success for authors and writers, how to avoid book publishing blunders, and how to create a million-dollar speech. All these have been fully revised, retitled, expanded, and republished in 2022. Her personal memoir, When God Says No, Revealing the Yes When Adversity and Loss Are Present, was revised in 2021. And to date, her books have earned more than 50 book awards. Her newest books, The Author's Walk, will be published in 2023, as well as her historical fiction debut, The Secret Journey, also in 2023. Judith's books have been translated into 17 languages with over 1 million copies sold. Her books and works have been featured on over 1,000 radio and TV shows, including repeat appearances on CNN, CNBC, and Oprah. She's worked with over 1,500 authors and created 500 bestsellers. Her print publications include Newsweek, People, Time, The Wall Street Journal, and yes, even The National Enquirer. Judith is based in Colorado and is the founding partner of The Book Shepherd, a book and publishing consulting and project management firm that works with authors at all stages of their book to create a book they never regret. In 2019, she founded the first Authors Hall of Fame, exclusively dedicated to ensuring the legacy of authors connected in some way with the state of Colorado. Judith Bryles, welcome to the Spotlight on Speaking show. Well, thank you for having me, Brett. And it's it's kind of fun, kind of like it's been quite a journey. <laughs> well, I, I, let, so tell me about that journey, Judith. So you've been at the speaking game for a long time. And yeah. I know you've been in various niches and all that. So kind of give us a, a little bit of the backstory, if you would. Well, you know, I started as a speaker. I never started as an author. I never intended to write. Uh, that 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 was an evolution from a workshop. Um, that I gave that was called Women and Money. Um, and it was really kind of the the dropping in that may, maybe there's a book here. Maybe maybe I should get this out. Um, but and, and nobody, Brett, told me that books bred more books. No, no one revealed that. And I actually reached out to one of my clients at the time. I was a stockbroker at the time. And I reached out to an editor of the Palo Alto Times. And I said, hey, Jack, you know that class I teach up here? And, you know, I, I told him the backstory of why all of a sudden it dropped in and I should do it. And um, and he, he, I said, can you help me? I, I don't know how to write a book. Uh, and do that. He said, I don't write books, but you ought to talk to Phil. Phil was one of his sports columnists. He wrote novels. So I had lunch with him and I ended up hiring him to coach me on that. And that was April of 1979. And um, from that, um, and, and back then I paid him $7,500. 
Now, that is like thirty thousand dollars today. Yeah. yeah. To show me how to write a book. So he just showed up at my office once a week with a tape recorder and said, "Start talking." <laughs> that's how. That's how we t- started doing it. And um, and then he showed it to his agent, who introduced me. Um, uh, that eventually led to me signing. I, I signed with Jacques and. But then I signed that I went and transitioned to uh, William Morris as an agency because I was a literary snob. I thought only legitimate authors were published with New York. And I so don't believe that now. But that was then. Yeah. This is now. And um, and then from that, the first book came out and it was so successful. It had three printings in three weeks um, and, and took off from there. And then and then. I was being asked to speak um, and uh, on the book. Now, prior to that, I was doing some speaking and how, and how I really started. Oh, my gosh. I made horrible mistakes because I didn't know anything about speaking, nothing about speaking. And um, I was just asked to come give a talk about investing to um, uh, a group of women in the East Bay. I lived in Northern California. And um, and and I was kind of the default speaker because the woman who was going to talk about an insurance agent or something, um, uh, her, her husband said she couldn't go out at nighttime to do this kind of thing. And I'm going, what? So I went over there and, you know, I, we sat in a circle, kind of like a book club does. And, and what I realized is I knew a freaking lot. Um, and I started, and then I turned that into the women in money class, how, how naive, how ignorant they were and how important it was for them to understand about money, because most of them at some point in their life would be solely responsible for whatever they had. So that's what started it. And then they started breeding and, um, and here we are 40 years later. So the book was sold, the manuscript was sold in 79. Um, and I'll never forget them saying, okay, so we're really looking forward to this book and now we have to edit it. And I thought, I thought I turned in the perfect book <laughs> wrong. Um, and these are the old days where you got actually the manuscript redlined back. Unbelievable what they used to do. They don't, they don't do the kind of editing today, New York, as they did back in the old days. And um, and we did it. And she said, great, we're looking forward to having you come out in June. And I'm thinking, geez, this is December. You've just bought the book six months. Okay, June is okay. And she said, no, no, no. June of the following year after. Uh, and that introduced me to the 18-month lag um, and going on to it. But that's what started it. And, and from there, moving on, and I, I learned very quickly that the way you sell books is not through bookstores. It is through speaking. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, if, having written 43 books, were they all following the method they used for that first book where you essentially talked your book or do you put pen to paper? What, what's your process for getting so much out there? That, that's that's a great question. Um, I, I dictated uh, my first few books totally. Um, and I got Dragon Speak when it was in infancy, mm-hmm. literally in infancy. Um, and I used that. I always had notes. I was a huge believer when I was putting my books together. Um, uh, the and I still supported the expandable file. Just get a file, everything you've got, just slot it up and put it in your categories. When you've got one that has a whole bunch of stuff in it, your notes, your papers, your magazine articles are pulled out, anything you're ripping out. What you've got a slot with a whole bunch in it that tells you you have a chapter, um, and I still I still do that forty years later. Those kind of things I have it. I have a basket at my side. You mentioned my next book, the author's uh, walk, and the difference between a journey and a walk. A journey is for traveling. You have a beginning and an end. The author's walk, there's no end. You, it's a continuum. It's a continuum. Right. So, with that. Um, I now, uh, literally, I, I actually write in my head, Brett, I have, I have uh, notes. I, I do, I can lay out an entire book with sticky notes, which is what I do. Cause I like the portability and moving them around. All I have to do is have a folder 
each chapter has different, I mean, I have codes that I use with colors and things like that. And um, I, I rarely do I dictate now because I can, once I, once I hit it, I'm a binge writer. And I think it's important for everyone to understand writing, what kind of writer they are. Do right. I get up and write every day? Actually, I do write every day, but I'm doing blogs. I'm doing newsletters. I'm writing for other clients. I'm doing those kind of things. For Davey personally, I'm a binge writer and I go away. And for example, in, in uh, February, I will be underground on a cruise ship for one solid week being waited on while I pound out the entire finished draft for the author's walk. Cool. So let's transition back into the speaking a little bit. So what was the impetus to move from the world of financial services and money management for women into <laughs> books and book publishing being your primary focus? Oh, my God. Truth be told, I was sick of being everyone's mother. <laughs> <laughs> the truthiness. <laughs> I, I just, um, I just was tired of it, um, and the responsibility and being on, on that kind of call all the time. I mean, I think we were on vacation in Hawaii, and one of my clients tracking down to see whether or not he should buy a new car, and I'm going, really, <laughs> Re really? Well, could you figure out the tax consequence? Really? And I decided that became the tipping point. Mm -hmm. Um, as I started to want to move on out of it. So with that said, um, it was uh, the first book people started calling me. And it was primarily women's groups because the title was called The Women's Guide to Financial Savvy. Great title. It's a great title. Um, publisher came up with it. And, um, and it's one of the, uh, of, of probably the 18 books I published with New York. There's only two covers I've liked. That was one of them. Um, but you learn with New York, they don't care what you think. Anyway, with that said, um, <laughs> that I, it, it started bringing in people that asked me to come speak and it was always fun. I was like, the cover of that book always had a vase with a rose in it. Um, and there was always a vase with a rose in it whenever I spoke, you know, that they, they do. And then I realized people are buying the books right there. But I never thought of carrying books with me in those early days. Not like I turned into a full-blown retail store speeches. <laughs> um, I mean, really, we had a spread. We had giant posters. We had all kinds of things. And it's it's how we created you know, um, during, during my career, you know, over five million dollars, three million in speaking fees, and over two million in book sales directly from speaking gigs. So I know you've done a lot of keynoting, Judith, in in the health industry. So tell me a little bit more how you got involved in that particular sector. Well, I never went to them. They came and stalked me, um, and I came out with a book in um, 1987. Um, and when when I really decided, I threw in the towel. I on all whole, all, I just didn't want anything to do with finance anymore. Was when a partner embezzled a million dollars from me, mm -hmm. and I had to step in and and save this project that she stole uh, monies from. And um, I went back to school to get my doctorate to learn how to run a boutique hotel. And it, I'm telling you, Brett, God did not put me on earth to be a hotel operator. <laughs> I learned how to do it. And eventually I had put it in bankruptcy. Eventually I brought it out. So my finance, you know, my finance background was helpful. And I was thrilled to say we paid every creditor 100 cents on the dollar, which is unusual in a bankruptcy. And then, um, but from that, uh, the dissertation, which was on ethics, do women undermine other women? My partner was a woman. And that, and a former close friend, I will say now, but anyway, I, I uh, took that and turned it into a commercial book, which was turned down by every major publisher, turned down, turned down. And it's one of my biggest sellers. And, and then I went with a very small independent press who got it. But in New York was afraid of it. New York was afraid of the book. Um, claiming that it would never get publicity. Oh, my God. Everything from the Wall Street Journal to Newsweek to Time to uh, he, uh, We Survived the National Enquirer to huge. And and the domino factor that started with that came with healthcare, where healthcare hospitals were doing community programs. They still do them. 
um, for because women targeted women, women was my target, and I was writing for women anyway. Um, and that they were looking, they wanted authors as speakers. They looked for different topics besides um, just the medical based ones because they were throwing out their line to reel in their target, which was women who were the primary decision makers on which doctors you used and that kind of thing. So I became the speaker at these conferences. And then I started carrying books. I had, dang, sell a lot of books. Um, full price, instant money, no refunds. I mean, it was a great. And then um, uh, several nurse execs came to one of the conferences in New York and said, you need to do a study because I had done nine national studies on this topic um, on us. We need you. And, you know, I poo-pooed it. I'm just saying, you know, I need to do another study like I you need know, a hole in my head. I just done this huge dissertation. And um, but they pursued and thank God they did. I ended up spending 20 years speaking to healthcare, nursing associations, executive teams in hospitals, retreats, all kinds of things. And and really developed as a speaker, a, a, a speaker. I became a spokesperson for uh, Bristol Myers for three years huh. um, from that and 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 even wrote a book for them called the confidence factor. Now I had a sandwich of dicey, toxic, bad behavior. And now let's rebuild it and bring it back out so I could make it like an Oreo cookie. And um, and it, it proved very successful. Very, you know, uh, I, the confidence book sold over 250,000 copies. Um, and there was just a lot that we could do with those things. But all it all started really with speaking. It all started with speaking. I just had no idea how big it could be. So obviously you've had great, great, great success as a keynote speaker and also as a person who put on your own events and, and emceed events in the author space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you think about the various channels that you delivered your message through, what do you think some of your maybe, you know, two or three biggest keys to success have been that built that speaking career? Oh, oh, always persistence. Um, I, I developed I, and I became a master marketer. I, I always had someone who worked for me um, in that could do the follow up. But um, I, I learned I, I did marketing when I was in the office and um, only I, I did, dedicated an hour a day to contacting people, sending them postcards only in my niche. It was only in the healthcare niche. That's where I ended up niching down to. And I became the go-to person. If you've got a toxic person, you better get Bryles in here. Um, and I, I can remember people saying, you know, they tell me about this horrendous problem. And I would say, so do you want you do you want my, you know, my um my my 15 second solution or do you want the forty thousand dollar one? Which one do you want? Well, tell me the fifteen thousand. The 15 second one, I said, fire her happy ass and get her out of there. And I <laughs> said, so we can't do that. Oh, I said, oh, so you haven't done your documentation. You haven't done the work you needed to do. I said, okay, I'll come in and do full training with all your employees. I'll go through this, that, and that. And I'll tell you at the very end, fire. So um, that, that was with toxicity. And that was with conflict resolution um, in, in going into um, that. So... I think that, that I think it's really important. One of the biggest mistakes authors, speakers can be author speakers. They, I put them in the same boat is they say they write for everyone or they can speak on any topic for everyone. Nonsense. Narrow it down. It's so much easier to be the, uh, you know, the whale in a pond versus the sardine in the sea. So mm -hmm. start figuring out where your expertise is. And that's what you stick to. If, if people want you to speak on other topics, I've had people come to me on time. Oh, Judith, will you do a program on time management? I can juggle a lot of stuff. But that's not my expertise. That, that is not my expertise I speak on on that. I mean, someone comes into my office, they go, oh, my God, chaos. Okay, I'm, I am visually, I have to have everything visually in front of me because, because the Thursday brain will not tell Friday what it did with stuff if it gets put away. I have to have it out until it's done. Then it can go bye-bye. 
So I'm, just, I'm curious, just, Judith, you had great success in the healthcare sector. I assume you don't play in that arena anymore. So why did you leave that arena? Oh, well, because of the healthcare sector, I was doing a gig up in Vancouver, um, a dental, and I did dental and hospital nursing. I was healthcare. Um, that um, I, we were all done. We were walking along. We were going to stay over a couple of days because I'd always wanted to have high tea in Victoria and see the gardens. And the next thing I knew, I'm on my butt. Um, and I had stepped in a gob of vanilla ice cream or yogurt and ended up rattling my brain. Um, I couldn't read for 18 months. Huh. Uh, the travel, I used to be in 12 states in a month. I was booked when this when this accident happened that um, I was booked over a year ahead, year and a half ahead. That was pretty much my calendar. I booked out a year. And, and John had to start traveling with me because I had these commitments. We anyone called me to speak, they, you know, it was like Judith would love to speak for you, but she's already booked on your dates. We we could not take any more dates. We had to figure out how we do. And one of the challenges in speaking, this was a huge aha. If anyone figures out that you have a cognitive problem, and I had I, I had a cognitive problem. It took me a year and a half to get my vision back, to learn how to read again. Um, to do a lot of things. I mean, I was kind of bubblegummy. And um, and to get myself back, I, I lost a skill. I was a math whiz, um, uh, Brett, and I, I can't even balance a checkbook. I lost my math skills. But what came in was a new gift to me because now I'm figuring I can't travel. The meds they started me, I couldn't travel the way I used to. How am I going to support my family? How am I going to do this? And I'd always helped authors with their books. I've always, I was their advocate. Anyone I knew from the speaking arena, oh, there's a book. Let me introduce you to my agent. Let me give you some ideas. Because one day in March of 81, when my book was going to come out in June of 81, I was speaking on a cruise. And uh, one of the speakers who is a friend sat me down. She says, you have a book coming out. We're going to go and have a drink and I'm going to teach you what you need to do. That three hour time has been paid forward. I can't tell you how many countless hours I've given to authors in, in from the encouragement, but the strategizing of what they need to do as this book goes forward. Well, I thought, you know, maybe I should be doing that. Maybe I can bring people to me. Now people travel to me to work with me. And that's how we started the resurrection um, of, of repositioning of where, because I've always been, I'm, I, if I have two addictions, it would be books and probably cooking in my household. <laughs> and so, you know, going forward with that was that. The gift I got was when I'm talking with a new potential client and I'm starting to hear and receive information about this book they're writing or they have written, I, I, visual, I can start visualizing what it looks like. I can visualize how the layout's going to go. Um, it's a whole new thing that I just feel their books. I see their books. So, so that's the gift. So when was the book shepherd officially born then? How, how many years are we going back? It was in 2000. We're going back to two. Oh, I was two. I, I mean, I started doing consulting and stuff um, for people. So it was in, you know, like 2002 ish. Um, but I didn't officially do the transition till 206. Okay. All right. Well, those are some great stories, Judith. And I do have a couple other questions I want to ask you, but before we do, Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Are you a business owner or entrepreneur who's had great success in the business world? And now you want to launch a speaking career to share your message with the world. If that's you, then listen up. 25-year speaking industry veteran Brett Ridgway has released his latest special report, Three Key Things Entrepreneurs Must Master to Build a Profitable Speaking Business. To pick up your copy, go to breadridgeway.com forward slash freebie. And we are back with the Spotlight on a Speaking Show with my guest, Dr. Judith Bryles. And, and my favorite question to ask the people that I have on the show, Judith, honestly, is you know, yeah. I ask you to bear your soul a little bit here and maybe share a few mistakes you've made along the way that you would highly encourage aspiring authors not to make. 
Oh God, we! I need I need all my fingers and toes and probably <laughs> people's fingers and toes. We all make mistakes, and I think it's important you you learn um, from those. One of one of the things is I've already kissed on it um, is and speaking on the wrong topic or getting put into that. And one of my personal mottos is "Don't do well what you have no business doing." So find your find your slot. Um, and then really learn it, really work it, really go into it. I had, I remember one gig I was speaking at and, um, and I got to the room and the topic that I thought I was speaking on was not what was registered in everyone's, um, you know, the conference mm -hmm. brochure. Um, and, you know, I had rumblings going on and I'm just saying, what's going on? And someone says, well, you're supposed to be doing this. I didn't speak on that. So I said, well, here's what we can do. Here are the topics that I speak on. I don't know how this happened. I apologize to you, but I can do this, 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 and this type of thing. All right. Um, I am not an expert in, in this area, and I would be doing you a disservice if I just tried to wing it. So if, if you'd like to hear about any of those, we can take a vote, and I'll go down that route. Um, and that if those of you are, look, you know, there, I'm sure there's something else on the conference um, agenda that you'd like to go to um, and I would you know it would you would not hurt my feelings if you got up and left several people got up and left but a whole bunch of people stayed and we had a great time I was due to repeat this session and the buzz was out that she's not doing this session she is doing this and if you want this you need to go here on that but I think it's very important for all speakers to really uh, do an interview with their meeting planner. Exactly what's the demographics? What are the percentages of male, female? What about ages? What are the problems for associations? Sometimes I've done a special survey as I did a lot of association meetings. I was not a corporate speaker. I was a primarily an association or you have an industry like healthcare, which had a whole bunch of associations within it. Um, that if you, you, um, really work that and know that it 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 will save you grief because it was a horrible ex it felt I felt horrible um going on that so my motto don't do well what you have no business doing know what you're supposed to be doing and that's where you do your fine tuning mm -hmm. yeah and 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 that would be you know one of them that would go on so that's one all right, so another one, um, I'm just trying to kind of not really my brain here. Um, I think it's really important to um, uh, learn how to say no, um, that if you never say no, your yeses are worthless. I, I, I think you need to understand what your bandwidth is, how many things you can take on. Speaking mm -hmm. is a grueling business. It is a grueling, grueling business. And that if you it, you run out of gas, you're tired. And these people who say they do 200 gigs a year, though, they're freaking liars. <laughs> um, really, people? Yeah. I mean, really, people? That you, you've got to really, you know, I, I, I revealed I was in a dozen states. I mean, it was an amazing thing that, you know, that what we could do. But sometimes I was so exhausted that I would come home to just sleep in my bed and go back out the next morning because I just need to do that. The, the other thing is I think you need to, um, when I mentioned that I, you know, I had um, this accident, but if it gets out that you've got a cognitive problem, you are dead in the speaking business. You've got to figure out how to cover what it's going. If you've got a broken leg or a broken arm, everyone knows that heals really well, but with a head, you don't know. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn how to hide stuff. I remember going into a gig in Vegas. I did for 13 years. I did uh, at the Mirage Hotel, this one conference for 13 years in a row we did before they just stopped doing it. Um, and I remember walking in, and this, is, this was maybe a month after I fell. And I walked in, and Bill, who the overall uh, planner for this, he, he just said, Judith, you look like shit. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and I said, don't worry. I'll have makeup on tomorrow. 
<laughs> so, so we went off. But during that time, John started traveling with me, and literally he would wind me up, get me to the stage, I'd do the thing, and then I was put to bed. Takes a long time to heal. So I think you have to be prepared to when those things um, happen. And, and there's time I've there's times mistakes I've made. <clears throat> I've always now learned when I travel for a speaking gig, whatever I'm gonna wear, I wear uniforms. I mean, you know, I the, the same thing in that way. I start writing writing things down um, because uh, people, if they've seen you here again, they will notice that I had one woman write back on the event. Didn't you wear those earrings six years ago when you were here? I'm going, maybe. So I started writing down what I wore, mm -hmm. um, and doing things. So I would have that if reference, if I ever went back and did a repeat, um, uh, uh, business. For that, I think um, a, a, another thing for a keynote speaker, whether you're the opening or the closing or the sandwich in between, a lot of times they have multiple key slots um, on that. I think it's important to mingle, but don't never drink, never drink um, on that. And one of the most effective ones, I was doing some closing session for a group of uh, technology CEOs of companies that did stuff. And I went to the barbecue, and this is this was in Corona del Mar in San Diego, beautiful, beautiful um, uh, venue. And I went to that, and I took pictures because there were the families there, the wives were there, um, kiddos were there, little you know babies. And um, I took pictures, and I invited all the wives to the closing keynote. So I said, you know, if you want to have some fun, I'm going to be doing a closing on communications snafus um, tomorrow. And so I highlighted them and the, the meeting planner said, what we have never had a standing room only closing session. What did you do? So be, be friend people, don't drink, schmooze, go around, I think. And I think it's always important to expect the unexpected. I've had, you know, I've shown up at events where my suitcase never does. Mm -hmm. So I started carrying whatever I was going to wear. And so it's very lightweight that I could go in and 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 do that. Um, had that. I I had a situation. Oh my God! I remember Brett telling you that my underwear fell off at a gig. Um, and what do you do? I ended up stepping out of them and leaving them. Um, and just kept going. So the mistake is make sure your clothes fit. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious, Judith, as a keynote speaker. How did you measure your success? Well, you know, um, success is not by standing ovations. Um, you and I have both been in National Speakers Association for years, and they used to, you know, everyone got a standing ovation. Nonsense. I think that there is other impact and other ways um, to look at things where you go in that, uh, my my experience has always been is the feedback I get because I um, I think a mistake big mistake is too many speakers are swoopers and they come in and they, they do a fine job and they grab their chicken split the single best thing you can do is hang out and schmooze and be available um, and 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 do that and I've had people I can't tell you how many people came up he said. The script you gave us today, this was on conflict resolution, the new script you gave us today, I just used, and it made all the difference in the world. And I said, just practice it. Once you get those three new lines, it will totally alter your world um, when you're dealing with a dicey manager or a colleague who is a jerk or any of those things. So my my experience was was the feedback the reason why i was booked ahead a year was i was good um and i also knew how to market myself um in doing that so um that's that i measured it that way that i get letters from people or i get phone calls or um any of that and of course we sold a lot of books so and and you know books are impulse buys um i think a mistake when authors say, well, go to my website and order a book, um, nonsense, they won't, you know, you're, you know, you're the speaker of the flavor of the month or whatever it is, it's in and out. It's, you've got to have things available. So we always made sure, you know, we, we went, United was our primary flight. 
we always we went to work and with my mileage status we could carry three three 70, fat, 70 pound boxes of books free so that's how we went to work so how have you adapted you to the virtual world since the online or the in-person events went away for a while one, well, one of the big challenges of the virtual world is everyone expects everything for free now. You know, everyone was doing webinars are supposed to be for free, right, um, on that. And I think that one of the things, it's just like the conversation you and I are having, that I, 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 I was having such a hard time with COVID with these teachers. And, and why, why can't you engage? I mean, you're engaging in your classroom. You, you keep the same techniques and you bring it into what we're doing going on. So one of my techniques is that everybody, if I am doing a, a workshop, like I, I teach, I have a new class I'm actually starting here in uh, February on how to create snappy, sassy, sizzling back cover and marketing copy um, for your books. And, and that... Um, I, I teach a, a, a four-week online course on being an uh, Amazon bestseller. I have converted my one-day, two-day unplugs, and I've broken them into, you know, a half day, half afternoon, you know, afternoon, afternoon kind of thing. So they have their morning to work because they all know that no one goes off mic. They will be hot-seated in a nanosecond with me if something's going on. Um, and, and I keep that going on that. And, you know, we, I, you get breaks, you can do things like that, but presenting virtually has not been a problem. I, I just, and I think speakers, people who speaking, who are used to moving around on a stage, who, who have come in where I did keynotes, but one of the things, mistake is, let me go back to your mistakes. If you don't, um, uh, Stay put. And I always offer to my meeting planners, look, at you have me for the day. Is there another program you'd like me to do for you, for your group? Now, there was method to my madness because then I would have another hit of exposure to maybe other members of their audience in more time. I will sell more books. Yeah. I will sell more books. And other people get maybe more of a, a different interactive experience with you in a workshop than they might have on a keynote uh type area that it could just be, be a booking another gig will come from that and i always have that happen so we we have those um as we go back and forth so you know that's what you know i did um uh, there there are so many there are so many things it's common to make a mistake you've got to get a fee and should you speak a lot of people say well i never will speak for free really really um, I had a rule that if I felt pa really passionate about it and they just didn't have my speaking fee, I would do up to 10 freebies a year. You know, if I really felt passionate mm -hmm. about it um, and covering it that way, or if I truly felt that there would be someone in that audience that could hire me mm -hmm. uh, at my full fee, I would go into that. The other thing I also did is um, because I had books, um, the, one of my other button pushers, you asked me this one time, I remember, Brett, you know, what kind of speaker were you? Were you a keynoter? Did you do workshops? Um, and you had another term. What was the other term? Platform seller. Platform seller. Okay, gag me here. Um, I hate platform spellers. I don't think you have to be a platform seller i'll never forget in san francisco at oh i can't remember the the, the uh, not amphitheater but the um uh it was a religious place and zig ziglar was speaking and and i wanted to see him zig zig and oh my god he came on and slid across the stage on his knees holding his book up claiming it was the bible Okay, that is so not me, Brett. <laughs> Number one, I can't slide across the stage on my knees. <laughs> it's so not me. And I think you have to find out. Now, I, I've, I, I, there's a couple of ways. Um, I always had in my contract that, and I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I always had in my contract 
um, that I was given up to an eight foot table for for uh, having educational materials. I always call them educational materials. That's called a book um, available to attendees. And I wanted it either in the registration area or if there was an exhibit hall, I would have a free exhibit area that was in my contract. Mm -hmm. And I didn't pay for that. And <clears throat> I found that whatever your book is, for example, when I was speaking on my book, The Confidence Factor, um, and I'm going through these 10 steps, the 10 commandments of building confidence. The second one was to delete negativity. And there was a, it, and there was a lot of stories always in my nonfiction books. And that there was a story. I mean, this woman of the 10,000 interviews I've done, Sharon Comlos is the one that just is so embedded. And I'm sure you've had some of those too. So embedded, you could recite what came from that in the interview. And so I would pull up and I said, let me tell you about Sharon Comos. And I would open, you know, I'd have my book and I'd carry your book to the stage. I'd have my book and I would just open it. I, it, you know, people think, oh, she's opening it. She's going to, about Sharon. And um, I don't care where I opened it. I could do it the back, the front, whatever. But I open it up and I start going through and reading and talking. Now they're thinking I'm reading. I'm not reading anything. I am now reciting. I am now going through it. I'm taking them on an emotional, unbelievable story coaster of a ride. Um, and I'm getting into that, that by the time they've seen me holding this book, they've seen me looking at reading it. They are already thinking, I need this book. I need this book. I am, I am selling the book without selling, saying, go buy my hustle. Um, the other thing I would do, because I would always um, uh, donate back 10 to 20% of our book proceeds uh, to that, and and I'd, I'd ask the group, do you have scholarships, or do you have a special fund you're raising money, because I'd like to support it, can I, you know, would you let me do that, and oh, yeah, and so uh, the introducer often would say, D you know, make sure you visit Judas book table because she's donating a percentage of all book sales to our scholarship fund i don't have to say anything for it. and i think if you will learn just those couple of those techniques it will so help a speaker and they don't look like they're a pushy dude or dudette <laughs> well yeah and i mean you have yeah. been around a lot you have so many great stories to share. And, and first of all, I would encourage anybody who's an aspiring speaker to actually listen to this interview again, because Judith submitted so many great nuggets of wisdom that you just need to take some notes and, and take action on these things. So yeah, obviously, exactly. Judith is a wealth of knowledge on anything yeah. related to books and speaking and all that. And I would highly encourage you to get into Judith's world in some way. So Judith, if somebody wants to do that, how do they do that? Where do they go? Well, my website was all, would always be the starting point. So that's thebookshepherd.com. Um, you can probably go to judithbriles.com and browse.com. It'll all direct you to thebookshepherd.com. Uh, and if you want to see what I'm up to, experiences. The experiences tab will have events that are coming up and floating around. And also, um, you know, I do a, a, a fresh detailed informational blog um, on Tuesdays, on Wednesdays, I have a very detailed uh, uh, newsletter that comes out. On Saturdays, I have a shorty, very shorty, inspirational, um, I call it <laughs> um, uh, blog. Sometimes it's four lines, some it could be two paragraphs. Very short Saturday nugget. And then on Thursdays, I do our radio, our podcast. And you know, we used to call it internet radio all the time, Brett, when I first started. Um, that's six years old. It's had over 13 million downloads. And it's called Author You, Your Guide to Book Publishing. So that's the way to continue uh, the journey of what's going on. But sign up for our blogs um, and, and join in. And you can take advantage of that. Well, such great, great stuff. So any, any final words of wisdom for, before the aspiring speaker out there before we wrap it up today? For an aspiring speaker, just start speaking. Stumble, make mistakes. It's okay. 
it's okay. That's the way you learn and practice your stories and dig down to when you were a kiddo. And, and people always say, how do I structure a speech? Well, that's a whole nother topic, but that in the structuring, I'm a big believer in stories, but your stories, we call them signature stories, not other people's stories. And it, it don't tell jokes. Oh, for God's sakes, don't tell jokes. <laughs> um, um, but do your stories and, and, and then work them into your key points so you can augment it. And sometimes it's, it, it could be about you, could be about something you've observed, something you've seen. You know, it can always be about you, by the way. You know, it's like when I talked to you about Sharon and, you know, what happened. I didn't tell you what happened to her. I won't get into that. But what happened to her um, and totally changed her, her world, just so flipped upside down, uh, bad before it got better. But um, those are the kind of things that people m are uh, memorizing. They're impactful. Um, so you want to go back to, so how do you tell when you're successful? The storytelling will be the key factor. Cool. All right. Well, this has been so much fun, Judith. And I, my heartfelt thanks to you for joining me today on the my pleasure. Right on Speaking Show. As always, I wish all of you out there the greatest of success in all that you do as you look to build your own profitable speaking business. If you haven't been to SpotlightOnSpeaking.com, hop on over there and register so you can be notified of upcoming episodes. As well as I'd encourage you to pick up a copy of my free special report, Three Key Things Entrepreneurs Must Master to Build a Profitable Speaking Business. And you can get that at brettridgeway.com. But again, thank you so much. My best wishes to you all. Have a great one. Take care. This has been the Spotlight on Speaking Show with Brett Ridgeway. Be sure to join us every week as we interview speaking industry pros and have them share their best tips for building a profitable speaking business. Until next week, thank you for tuning in and remember to visit our website at SpotlightOnSpeaking.com so you can enjoy even more great episodes like this one. While you're here, be sure to subscribe via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Spotlight on Speaking Show. Until then, our sincere best wishes to you for the greatest of success as you work to build your own profitable speaking business.